In the darkness Molly Grew saw that the Lady Amalthea turning far away, stretching out a hand on which the ring and middle fingers were equal length. The strange place on her forehead was glowing as bright as a flower. Then the wind was gone as though it had never been, and the stone walls were around them once more, the dull chamber as gay as noon after Mabruk's night. The wizard was crouched almost to the floor staring at the Lady Amalthea. His wise, benevolent face looked like the face of a drowned man, and his beard dipped thinly from his chin like stagnant water. Prince Lear took him by the arm. "'Come on, old man,' he said, not unkindly. "'This way out, Grandad. I'll write you a reference.' "'I am going,' Mabrook said. "'Not from fear of you, you lump of stale dough, "'nor your mad, ungrateful father, "'nor of your new magician. "'Much happiness may you have him.' "'His eyes met King Haggard's hungry eyes, "'and he laughed like a goat. "'Haggard, I would not be you for all the world.' he declared, you have let your doom in by the front door, though it will not depart that way. I would explain myself more fully, but I am no longer in your service. That is a pity, for there will come a time when none but a master may be able to save you, and in that hour you will have Schmendrick to call upon. Farewell, poor Haggard, farewell. Still laughing, he disappeared, but his mirth dwelled forever in the corners of that chamber, like the smell of smoke or of old cold dust. Well, said King Haggard in the gray moonlight. Well, he came slowly forward towards Smendrick and Molly, his feet silent, his head weaving almost playfully. Stand still, he commanded when they moved. I want to see your faces. His breath rasped like a knife on a grindstone as he peered from one to the other. Closer, he grumbled, squinting through the dark. Come closer, closer, I want to see you. Light a light, then, said Molly Grew. The calmness of her own voice frightened her more than the fury of the old wizard had. It is easy to be brave for her sake, she thought, but if I begin to be brave on my own account, when will it, when will it end? I never light lights, the king replied. What is the good of lights? He turned from them, muttering to himself. One face is almost guileless, almost foolish, but not quite foolish enough. The other face is a face like my face, and that must mean danger. Yet I saw them all at the gate. Why did I let them enter, then? Mabrook was right. I have grown old and daft and easy. Still, I see only haggard when I look in their eyes. Prince Lear stirred nervously as the king paced across the throne room, toward the Lady Amalthea. She was again gazing at the window, and King Haggard had drawn very near before she wheeled swiftly, lowering her head in a curious manner. "'I will not touch you,' he said, and she stood still. "'Why do you linger at the window?' he demanded. "'What are you looking at?' "'I am looking at the sea,' said the Lady Amalthea. Her voice was low and tremulous, but not with fear, but with life, and a new butterfly— shivers in the sun. Ah, said the king, yes, the sea is always good. There is nothing that I can look at for very long except for the sea. He stared at the Lady Amalthea's face for a long time, his own face giving back none of her light, as Prince Lear's had, but taking it in and keeping it somewheres. His breath was as musty as the wizard's wind, but Lady Amalthea never moved. Suddenly he shouted, what is the matter with your eyes? They are full of green leaves, crowded with trees and streams and small animals. Where am I? Why can I not see myself in your eyes? The Lady Amalthea did not answer him. King Haggard swung around to face Schmendrick and Molly. His scimitar smile laid its cold edge along their throats. Who is she? he demanded. Schmendrick coughed several times. The Lady Amalthea is my niece, he offered. I am her only living relative, and so her guardian. No, date the, no doubt the state of her attire puzzles you, but it is easily explained. On our journey we were attacked by bandits, and robbed of all of our— What nonsense are you jabbering? What about her attire? The king turned again to regard the white girl, and Schmendrick suddenly understood that neither King Haggard nor his son 
had noticed that she was naked under the rags of his cloak. The Lady Amalthea held herself so gracefully that she made shreds and tatters seem the only fitting dress for a princess, and besides, she did not know that she was naked. It was the armored king who seemed bare before her. King Haggard said, What she wears, what she may have befallen you, what you all are to one another, these things are fortunately no concern of mine. In such matters you may lie to me as much as you dare. I want to know who she is. I want to know how she broke Mabrook's magic without saying a word. I want to know why there are green leaves and fox cubs in her eyes. Speak quickly and avoid the temptation to lie, especially about the green leaves. Answer me. Schmendrick did not reply quickly. He made a few small sounds of an earnest nature, but not a sensible word was among them. Molly Grew gathered her courage to speak, even though she suspected that it was impossible to speak the truth to King Haggard. Something in his wintry presence blighted all words, tangled meanings, and bent honest intentions into shapes as tormented as the towers of his castle. Still, she would have spoken, but another voice was heard in the gloomy chamber, the light, kind, silly voice of the young Prince Lear. Father, what difference does it make? She is here now. King Haggard sighed. It was not a gentle sound, but a low and scraping. Not a sound of surrender, but the rumbling meditation of a tiger taught to spring. Of course, you are right, he said. She is here. They are all here, and whether they mean my doom or not, I will look at them for a while. A pleasant air of disaster attends them. Perhaps this is what I want. To Schmendrick, he said curtly, As my magician, you will entertain me when I wish to be entertained, in manners very, variously profound and frivolous. You will be expected to know when you are required, and in what guise, for I cannot be forever identifying my moods and desires for your benefit. You will receive no wages, since that is certainly not what you have come here for. And as for your drab, your assistant, whatever you choose to call her, she will serve me also if she wishes to remain in my castle. From this evening, she is cook and maid servant together, scrub woman and scullery maid as well. He paused, seemingly waiting for Molly to protest, but she only nodded. The moon had moved away from the window, but Prince Lear could see that the dark room was no darker than that. The cool brightness of Lady Amalthea grew more slowly than had Mabrook's wind, but the prince understood quite well that it was far more dangerous. He wanted to write poems by that light and he had never wanted to write poems before. "'You may come and go as you please,' said King Haggard to the Lady Amalthea. "'It may have been foolish of me to admit you, but I am not so foolish as to forbid you this door or that. My secrets guard themselves. Will yours do the same?' 